Bernardo, queria agradecer ao Dr. Alexandre Lourenço este convite, mas sobretudo esta iniciativa sobre um tema que nos é tão caro a todos e que todos temos uma palavra a dizer e que já percebemos que experiências diferentes às vezes levam a resultados iguais e que sobretudo o serviço de urgência é um serviço em que a sua gestão é a gestão do hospital, do meu ponto de vista. A gestão do serviço de urgência implica a gestão do hospital inteiro. E já vimos também que soluções a montante e ajudante também têm importância uh, fundamental. Delivering urgent and emergency care is actually a huge challenge uh, in England. You will have seen the number of uh, references in newspapers over this last winter to the fact that pretty much every emergency hospital in England have been unable to manage the demand. Uh, and in England, they think, I am Scottish by the way, but in England they think they've got it all sorted. You can tell they haven't, okay? So there is no easy answer to the problem. And what has been incredibly interesting over yesterday and today is the realization that actually the problems are the same um, the cause of the problems might be different and the solutions that we find for them might also be different. But ultimately, we have too many people coming into our emergency departments and we don't have enough people going out quickly enough at the back end. It's as simple uh, as that. Uh, we have had the... Uh, so I'm going to take you through um, just a little bit about the hospital where I work. Uh, some of those challenges, the journey that we've been on, and I think it is really important that people uh, recognize that there are no overnight solutions to this problem, but that it is a journey. Um, and there are some quick wins, there are things that we can do quickly, but there are the, the sustainable model is a long-term one. Um, and so, but I'll, I'll share with you what we've been on that journey and what we've done sorry, some of the key principles, and then we'll see if there's any questions. This is our hospital, my emergency department. Uh, I, it's a very, very old hospital. Um, it is not fit for purpose. Our emergency department in the last uh, five or six years has gone through three different reorganizations because it's not been big enough. Um, so we add bits here and there just to try and make it fit. Um, we really could do with a bigger hospital. And we were talking, I think, last night at dinner about some brand new hospital somewhere that looked lovely and shiny. Uh, I can guarantee you that the loveliness and the shininess of that hospital will not in and of itself solve their problem, that they too will end up with similar problems. But it is a much nicer environment to have to work in. And the environment is important. So this is, um, just gives you an idea of where the hospital is situated. Okay, so this is the Luton and Dunstable. We serve the people of Luton. We also serve some of the people from Bedfordshire and from North Hertfordshire. Uh, we, are, we have a hospital north of us that's a bit smaller than ours um, that we are currently in the process of taking over. So we are uh, merging or, or acquiring this hospital in order to make both hospitals sustainable for the future. Uh, we have a hospital to the south and to the east of, uh, that are more or less the same size as, as their hospital. So we serve a population of 315,000. We have about 93,000 inpatients in a year, 375,000 outpatients. Very busy maternity unit with just over 5,000 births in the year. We have 670 beds um, and we have 80 day beds, so your day surgery. We have a budget of 310 uh, million and just under 4,000 staff. In, in England, this is considered to be a medium-sized district general hospital. It's, it's uh, not considered uh, large by any manner of means. We, ha we are a foundation trust. So in England, you have two types of hospitals. You have uh, foundation trusts and non-foundation trusts. All the foundation trust means is that 
the hospitals that have been given that, that freedom have gone through a scrutiny and met certain criteria which allows them a lot more autonomy in the decisions that they make and also allows them to reinvest any surplus at the end of the year rather than that money having to go towards the, the national deficit. So there are some advantages to being a foundation trust, but as time has gone on, those advantages are less. Uh, we do have, uh, this is our executive management structure, but there is a, a board of governors as well that actually are responsible for holding the executive to account. The chairman uh, who sits uh, over the hospital uh, appoints the chief executive and obviously the chief executive then appoints the rest of, his, of the team. Uh, we do have non-executive directors also on the board and they are lay people and their job is to bring some challenge into the decisions uh, that are made by the executive team. I'm sure that's not much different to what you have, you have here. Um, as was said in the introduction, um, we are the only hospital in England to have consistently met the four-hour emergency care target every week since 2012. I don't shout that too often or too loudly because I feel every day as if we're on the cliff edge and at any moment <laughs> that could change. Um, we are very proud of what we've been able to achieve but we're under no illusions that actually it is a, a changing picture every day and you have to always be careful because uh, you could easily fall over at any point unless you're prepared. For those of you who are not aware of the four-hour emergency care target, this was brought in by the government in 2004. It was originally set at 98%, that's 98% of all patients who come into the accident and emergency department needed to be treated, seen treated, and discharged or admitted in less than four hours. In 2010, that got changed because to 95% because there was a sense that the 2% that was allowed for those critically ill, those sort of major trauma patients was not enough. Uh, and so it was reduced to 95%. So that standard uh, continues, and every chief executive, every, your, I think you call them presidents here of your hospitals, are accountable for the delivery of that target, as well as the other cancer targets and the, every other target that is set by, by the government. I think the other interesting point I would make here is, is that we are one of the few trusts in the country that have been in financial balance that we posted a surplus every year for the last 15 years. Um, and I think it's really important because quality is, if we deliver quality care, it is cheaper. It does not cost more to deliver a quality service. So I think it, 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 there are huge challenges, and I, I say that again the same way. I don't, we don't go out there and you won't see us shouting it from anywhere because you just don't know. Uh, the things are so precarious, but we are very pleased that we are able to do that and deliver in that time. So some of the key challenges, they are exactly the same, and I'm not going to dwell on a lot of these because over the last uh, 24 hours, Far more eminent people have talked in a lot more detail about these, but I think you will see from this that they are very much the same. So we have a rising number of elderly patients and we have gaps in the services out there in the community. Patients are living longer. It's a good thing, except that we find it difficult to, to meet the, the needs of the complex patients. Um, Particular to us is our physical hospital. We are situated literally right next to the M1 motorway and we are surrounded by houses. So we have nowhere to go in terms of physical, physical expansion. Um, and obviously building upwards has its own uh, issues and we would have to continue to deliver the service whilst it was like a building site. So we do have a number of um, uh, opportunities to take some services off the site to others uh, to, to, and relocate them in order to make better use of the estate. Shortages in key staff groups, nursing being one of the biggest ones. 
and I am ever so grateful. We have amazing Portuguese nurses in our emergency department. They are absolutely fabulous. I love them to bits. Um, and they have, they've come over and they have been promoted very quickly because their standard is so good. Uh, and they are just, they're just wonderful, wonderful nurses. So I am sorry, but I don't want to give them back just yet. Uh, they, are, they, they are really, really good. And they, they contribute a lot to what we've been able to achieve. Uh, we do have other staff groups that we have shortages in which impact, especially on the front door and turning people around. And they're like physiotherapists. So we have struggled. Um, we've struggled with um, pharmacists as well. Uh, that seems to be improving a little bit now. And of course, doctors. There are different specialties that provide us with a challenge. I think the uncertainty, um, or especially because in England anyway, I'm not sure here, uh, healthcare is, is intrinsically linked to politics. And so you just don't know when the next reorganization is going to take place. You just don't know when some other power is going to come along and tell you you need to do things differently again. And it just messes everything up and you have to start all over again. So, and I think the sustainability. So uh, we are move, we have to move to a seven-day service. Gone are the days when it could be Monday to Friday, nine to five long gone. We have to be able to be open seven days a week and we have to have services available seven days a week. It's what the public want, it's what they demand. Uh, and that, in order to be able to do that, especially for some of our smaller specialties, that means that we have to integrate with somebody else in order to be able to deliver that. And so we are uh, currently working through a sustainability program uh, with two other hospitals to see if we can create rotors and rosters that will work uh, for on calls, etc., to be able to do that. And obviously the rising cost of keeping these people in hospital is, is, a, is a problem. Overstretched primary care. We have excellent primary care uh, system set up. Uh, but it is uh, patchy, its effectiveness is, is patchy. Uh, locally to us in Luton, uh, Luton is a very deprived uh, area and so recruiting GPs is really, really difficult and uh, we have a lot of locum GPs who don't know the area, who come and go and therefore we don't get the same uh, efficiency from them. They are also still very much a nine to five, Monday to Friday service. Uh, and of, until they, are, um, they improve the funding to primary care, we can't expect them to be able to do much else. And there is a lack of seven day services in the community. Uh, that is improving, but again, we, it's a challenge for us because we have to discharge every day. You can't just discharge Monday to Friday. And so if those services are not there at the weekend, then that becomes a problem for us. And then there are the competing priorities. So we have our 18 weeks from referral to treatment uh, competes with our a &E target. So you'll have heard that the mandate in, in England over the winter was cancel elective surgery in order to manage the emergency. But obviously that then impacts on your meeting the 18 week target. So there is a real dilemma at an executive level as to how you balance uh, those priorities. And obviously the elective work brings all the money into the hospital. And so uh, we end up opening more beds, etc. So it is, um, it is a problem for us. So here's our emergency department. Um, it's, uh, just, if you see that screen that sits at the back there. So we use technology a lot. It is the only, one of the only ways that we are able to manage the flow of patients in and out of the hospital. So embrace technology. That, that session earlier was really interesting. Some of it I was thinking, really? But you know what? We have got to accept that technology is the way of the future and we have to make it work for us. Um, this screen there is, is, is the ambulance screen. So we have a link to the ambulance service so that we know what's coming our way. So they, f they populate that for us, so we know when an ambulance is on its way into us, what time is expected to arrive, we know the sex of the person and the age of the individual, and just a little bit about whether they're hemodynamically stable or not, so just a little bit about them. So when we are thinking ahead in the next half hour, how many, how many um, um, trolleys do I need, we count this in, in the equation. Um, 
Last year, our emergency department saw 140, just over 144,000 people. Um, that's about 8,500 attendances a month. Um, I will, this, oh, sorry, my, so if I, um, the 101,000 came into our emergency department and we sent 43,500 to what we call the urgent GP center. And I'll just come on to that uh, sh shortly. It is a, a service or, a, or a, a pathway, more than a service, that we set up to take, to deal with the overcrowding in our a &E department. Um, which is why, oh, sorry, I'm hopeless with this. Which is why, if you look at our minors, they are a much smaller percentage of, of uh, our a &E patients because all minor illnesses during the hours that the GP service is open go, are streamed to that service. And so this ten, the 23% the of minors are pretty much minor injuries as opposed to minor illness. This is a typical graph in England. It's going up. More and more people coming into the hospital. I'm sure yours, it's exactly the same. More and more people. These are attendances, not admissions. So these are attendances. We have a, a changing demographic. I think what we have seen is we have seen a significant increase in people coming in by ambulance. We've seen an, an, a big increase in the under 15s. And that's partly been driven by uh, changes to the hospital north of us, um, but also because we opened a, a, a new uh, emergency department for children. So a stand, it sits within our department, but it's, and people hear about it and people want to come, and once they bring one child, they'll come back with the next child and the next child. Uh, we haven't seen as big an increase in the over 80s. The difference being that for every thousand of these that we see, we will send 999 home. For every thousand of these that we see, we'll probably have to admit 999. So the impact in terms of her beds is very different. And we have also seen an increase uh, year on year in our uh, attendances in the out of hours, which will be, uh, we consider to be after 10 o'clock at night. So in 2010, we were the worst performing hospital in the East, trust in the East of, East of England in relation to the 95%. Uh, by 2012, we were consistently, week in, week out, delivering the 95%. And this is a team of people uh, who have been responsible for uh, that work. Now, the names are not really important, but I think what is important is who they represent, because for us, one of the first things that we knew was this couldn't just be an a &E problem. This had to be a whole hospital problem, and we needed to work together as a whole hospital to be able to resolve it, and we needed clinical engagement at the highest level. Dr. Ramsey is, is one of her acute physicians, but is also one of her medical directors, um, and Dave Kirby is a, um, a consultant in emergency medicine, um, and he's also one of, another one of her medical directors. Uh, that previous presentation or discussion around having uh, dedicated teams was very interesting because obviously we do have dedicated teams in, in, in England. We have um, a school of emergency medicine and all trainees have to go through and, and spend some time in emergency, in emergency departments as part of their general training. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's the answer for everybody, but for us, we do have that dedicated team but what we do have is a good work in relationship with our uh, acute physicians and with our medical colleagues. Um, Dr. Carly Farrow is our, our clinical director in emergency medicine. General management, we have a very, very good general management team. These are, are, are groups of people who are working uh, within the, the, the sort of the divisions much closer to the day-to-day, -day, um, and they are also considered part. It doesn't matter whether you are a general manager for radiology or a general manager for surgery. Every single one of them contribute to the solution and are part of it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have nursing. You, we, you cannot solve this problem without having good engagement from your nursing teams. They are absolutely crucial uh, to the success. 
the trust board, uh, this Pauline Phillip no longer is our chief exec, she's now the national director for urgent and emergency care, so she uh, has moved on. Um, but when she came in 2010, she was given the mandate, fix it, because it was such a mess. And so a lot of the work that I'm sharing with you today was driven by her and was her vision. And we have what we call patient flow teams uh, that I manage, and then we have an integrated discharge team, which we'll talk a little bit more about as well. So what changed? Well, new leadership. So we've heard right throughout this conference the importance of leadership. And that's not just at president level, it is at every level in the organization. It's clinical leadership, it's nursing leadership, it is uh, ma general management leadership. It is hugely important. And it is very difficult to not make this about people because in order to start the process, it is very much about people and personality a lot of the time because you, go, you have to use those people to influence you use those people to motivate. Um, now, obviously, over a period of time, uh, you need to back that up with systems and processes that is not person dependent. But initially, it is really important that we have engaged clinical leaders and leaders throughout the organization. I think investment, you can't do this unless the environment in which people are working is equipped to be able to deliver what they have to deliver. So when Pauline came in, our emergency department was far too small. So in, the first thing she did was re reorganize the department uh, and make some changes. Um, the other thing I think, and we talked about that earlier, somebody mentioned the can-do culture. So that whole everybody can fix this. It's in our gift. And if everybody works together, so you come to work every day, you come to work knowing that you're going to, you're going to have a good day and you're going to sort it. And I think it takes time to be able to do that, but if you can get your leaders to be able to motivate teams and be able to get them to actually believe that, it makes, a very different, it makes for a very different working ambient when you've got problems. I think the real-time information and investment in IT is, is, is really crucial. We have, I have a, a room that is a bit like NASA, so I have a whole wall that's just full of screens with all the information that I need, and I can, and I can, some of it I can access at home, uh, I can access on my iPad, but it is really important. Having real-time information is really key. Um, it, when, when I first went to the hospital, they had people walking around counting beds, you know, literally walking around. So by the time they got around the hospital and came back, it was no longer valid because things had changed. There are programs out there that do that for you that are that are um, that, that there's technology there and I think investing in technology to, to be able to do that is hugely important and to support the decision making all of our managers can see what's in A&E from their home they can see where the empty beds are in the hospital it means when you're on call or when you're working from home and you're supporting from home you don't often physically have to come in. You can make those decisions because you can see it there. So again, that investment and that ability to be able to provide that support. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the having the dedicated team in A&E. And somebody mentioned about chest pain and the possibility that somebody might discharge a patient with chest pain. Um, so I think that what we have done and we've, we've been able to do quite successfully is to merge the dedicated A&E team and our acute medicine team. So we have a dedicated physician in A&E working alongside the consultant in emergency medicine uh, from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week. Um, and they work together, and we believe that the, the, the more senior the, the professional who sees the patient, the, the more likely you are to discharge them if you can get them in early in the pathway. So it used to be that when a patient came to A&E and they needed referral on to medicine, that they would wait in A&E until a bed became available on the assessment unit, and then the patients would move through to the assessment unit and they'd, or the ward. They'd get seen by the 
the doctor there and then they'd make a decision. So what we've done is just brought the doctor to the patient instead. And it's again, it's a filter. It's a barrier because the decision to admit is always the easiest one because then it's somebody else's problem. So what we've tried to do is to put barriers in the way of that happening so that the patients, if they do need to be referred to a specialty for an opinion, that is what it is, it's an opinion. It is not a decision to admit. Once they've been seen by that specialty, if that specialty then say, yes, this person definitely needs to be admitted, then they will go through, and only then do they get through to the rest of the hospital. So we try and manage those patients as close to the front of the hospital as possible to avoid that, because once they're in and in the bed, getting them back out again then becomes such a big problem. Uh, the front door streaming, I'll just go into in a little bit, uh, I've got a slide on that, so I'll come back to that. The ambulatory care, um, most places now have got. Um, the other thing that there was a challenge for us was that it was very late in the patient's journey in A&E before we knew that they needed a bed. So the referrals, because they were being slow to be seen, sometimes it would be three hours before somebody would say, oh, I need a medical bed or I need a surgical bed for this patient. And we felt, at that time, everybody scurrying around looking for a bed for that patient, and we thought, this is crazy. Because the, the um, consultant in emergency medicine who's in charge of the shop floor can look at a patient, see their triage, and can tell you pretty much if somebody's going to come in or not. We're not expect, we don't hold them to it, but we say, look, give us your, your best guess. Do you think we're going to need a bed for this person, or do you think you can turn this person around and get them home? And so we have introduced a new column on our... On our um, patient tracking system where it's a, it's a forward view and that's what we call it so we know after the, as soon as the patient's been triaged the consultant in emergency medicine will have a quick look at the patient look at their age look at what the, their presenting condition was think about what time of day it is and then we'll kind of do a rough and ready guesstimate as to whether or not this person and we'll write down medicine surgery home you know, ambulatory or whatever it might be. And that allows the patient flow team to then work on finding a bed for that person well before the decision to admit is actually made. So what we've tried to do in everything that we've been doing is keep the flow going out of A&E. Do not allow any blockages out of A&E. And the patient flow team, so the bed management team, that is their job, okay? And they're, they're there 24-7. And they work with a &E, they work with the rest of the hospital, and they know where all the empty beds are, they monitor all of that, they know all the discharges for the day, uh, who's going home and who's not, and so they manage that whole system, um, which helps us stop the blockage out of, of a &E. And then we, ha we introduced an integrated discharge team, and this is where uh, the long-term solution comes in. We have three local authorities that we discharge patients to, okay, for social care. So we have Luton Borough Council, we have Central Beds Council, and we have Hertfordshire Council. They're all slightly different. Some have more beds than others, and therefore we end up with problems in deciding who's going out and how quickly we can get somebody out. So we ask them to come and work with us. So the social workers from each of those areas now work in the hospital every day. The community nurses, uh, representatives from the community team work as part of this integrated team. They have a big office. Again, all the information is available. It's an open plan. They talk to each other and they are able to expedite the discharges for patients because they don't have that bureaucracy of having to call somebody who's in a different building and who's in a, you know, five miles down the road or whatever, they're all together and they can make those decisions. The streaming, all it does is helps overcrowding. And I sorry, I'm just nearly out of time, so I'll quiz through this. Um, the patients who come to A&E who do not need to be there need to go somewhere. And they've come more often than not because they've not been able to access primary care. Now, they may have chosen not to access it, or they may genuinely have tried, and the appointment will not be till tomorrow or the next day, and they don't want to wait. 
And so when they come to our, department, our hospital, the first person, anybody who walks in, the first person they meet is a senior nurse, uh, a nurse practitioner, who's very experienced. And she will have a very quick conversation with them. What's wrong with you? Um, and if you can walk without being out of breath, if, if you can walk, if you can talk without being out of breath, and you've got an illness and not an injury, you go to, to, to the GP. And, and, you, and the GP is situated literally next to A&E. Okay? But we don't run it. It's run by primary care doctors. Um, and, but the patients who we send there remain under the four-hour target as well. All it, they were never going to be admitted, so they don't impact on our beds. So they don't contribute to the blockages. The, all it does is takes the noise out of A&E, and it allows the A&E doctors to be able to have more time and to see patients earlier in, in their pathway. It is paid for as a block contract by the, the commissioning group. Okay, so we, d we don't pay for it, it's paid for by the commissioning group. Um, and they're open from eight o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. And we can stream, we, we've gone as far as 200 patients in one day to them. Um, so we work them hard. And it is important that we do that, that we keep those people out of the emergency department. This is a sticking plaster. This is not a permanent solution by any manner of means. The right solution is better access in primary care. But it is what it is. We have to deal with the now. And this is a solution that helps us keep A&E safe and stops the overcrowding. Um, uh, I don't think there's anything there. Uh, there are some, just for the chest pain protocol, if you see it there, so just in case anybody's concerned, there are some exclusions from that, but uh, on the whole, it's, it's fairly, and we're happy to share any and all of this with anybody, if it's of any use to anybody, that's, that's not a problem. Um, last week, this is from our hospital um, uh, in, in Northampton, a man died, he had a cardiac arrest while waiting to be treated in the waiting room. We, we have to avoid those kinds of things from happening. We have to find ways of getting those patients out of the, uh, the a &E department. So I'll just leave you with the key uh, principles. It has to start from the top. So you have to be, have board level commitment, strong clinical and managerial leadership. The whole hospital has got to embrace this. Uh, it's about safety. It is not about four hours. It is about safety. We do not want to have people sitting in a waiting room and we don't know how unwell they are. Come on, all they've had is a triage two, three hours ago. We need to be able to process those patients quickly and make sure that they're cared for. Medical and nursing engagement. We have to manage the back door just as aggressively as we manage the front door. So your discharges and your work with uh, social care is key to that. But for me, it's simple. If I have to have 100 patients coming in today, I have to get 100 out. And I don't make it, for most people in the hospital, I don't make it any more complicated than that. So we know how many people have come in so far today, uh, and we know how many more are expected to come, because as we know, it's very predictable. And we work on those numbers every two hours throughout the day. You come into the, my control room, and those numbers are there for everybody. So we know how many beds were short how much more work everybody has to do, to do and how we can, and then we work on getting those beds as they come up. We always tell people uh, to shout for help early. If you think you're drowning, don't wait until you've drowned, too late. Um, you have to make sure that we stop the car crash from happening rather, it's too late once it's happened. Thank you, I'm sorry I'm going over my time, thank you. Depois desta excelente palestra da Median em que no fundo foram apresentadas uh, algumas soluções.